Welcome to episode 198 of Dial the Gate, the Stargate Oral History Project. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much for joining me. I have Rob Fournier, armorer of Stargate SG-1, Atlantis, and Universe, joining us this episode uh, so we can uh, discuss how these uh, uh, amazing paramilitary teams who have wowed us over the years are brought uh, to life to be made just a little bit more realistic than they could be if no one was uh, helping them out along the way. But before we get into it, if you uh, enjoy Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, please please click that like button. It makes a difference and will help the show continue to grow. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops. And you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next uh, few weeks on the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.com. Net YouTube channels. This is a live stream, so my moderators, I think I have uh, Tracy, Anthony, and I think Jeremy uh, in the uh, live stream, and uh, if you have any questions for Rob Fournier uh, as we go through the material, go ahead and submit them to them, and they will set those questions aside for me to review at the end of the show. In the meantime, I am pleased to welcome to the show Rob Fournier. Armorer uh, for Stargate SG-1 Atlantis and Universe. Is it P-51 Productions? Is that what it is, sir? Yeah, that's correct, David. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. Oh, I'm glad to be here. It's a beautiful day, and um, it's really uh, an honor to be on your show. Well, I, I appreciate having you. Th th this franchise has been, I mean, 17 seasons of television. Were you there from the first season? Did you come in a little bit later? What's what's your Stargate story? Uh, I was there since the inception of the pilot of SG-1 all the way to the very end of the universe. So on and off, uh, we were doing other productions, but uh, my main employment for those seasons was definitely the Stargate franchises. Wow. And what was it like being a part of that journey? Uh, it was a long journey, but uh, lots of very good, fond memories with both the cast and crew. Um, we worked days and nights and long hours and really remote locations and studio. And And I was always a fan of the Stargate movie with Kurt Russell. So when that came to town, I jumped all over it and um, I had to be interviewed by some of the exec producers and and they wanted to know more about me and uh, how I can train the cast and how I'd apply myself to the action sequences with uh, the cast. But I was also involved on a script level too because I changed certain dialogues, you know, with the writers, with Brad Wright and Rob Cooper and all these wonderful people. And uh, so I was really heavily involved right from the get-go. What kind of uh, of uh, dialogue changes would you make? Uh, they were always, uh, they had problems sometimes uh, bringing across the right uh, lingo, military lingo. And we know that SG-1 was United States Air Force, but they also intervened with Marine Corps, U.S. Army, yeah. U.S. Navy. So you had to have the right lingo and uh it was a lot of it had to do with also dress and deportment, the uniforms, mm -hmm. uh, the actual military lifestyle that had to be embedded into our main forecast uh, right from the get go. And um, a lot of that came out with uh, we had like a, a small boot camp training for our four lead cast. And that's where I first met them all for SG1. Uh, for SG-1, yeah. Wow. yeah, And uh, I had to do the same with Atlantis and the same with uh, Universe. Universe wasn't as heavy. It wasn't that type of a show, but I still had to train three or four of the cast, including on Universe with Robert Carlyle. But uh, SG-1 was definitely kind of the benchmark for uh, training and uh, implementing all of my knowledge and spreading it amongst the cast. So let's let's talk about you. Well, that's why, why I have you here. Uh, where uh, are you? Do you have a military background? What what is the story that led you into this industry in in this specific department? 
Well, I was, uh, I already knew I was going to join the military when I was uh, still in high school. I always wanted to join the military. I actually wanted to be a fighter pilot. And uh, I went through air crew selection. My marks weren't quite high enough. It's very, very difficult to get into that program. Uh, so then I enlisted in the uh, Canadian Armed Forces. I was in the infantry and I spent five years in the army and I had a lot of qualifications. Uh, I spent uh, three out of the five years I was stationed in Germany. And I was actually there when the wall came down. So you wow. got to see quite a transition in Europe. Wow. But uh, no regrets. I loved every minute of it. I was 18 when I joined and I was 23 years old, basically, when I got out. Oh, sorry, I was, yeah, I was 23. And then I got, uh, I went to film school. I wanted to be an actor, like everybody else that comes to Vancouver, right? <laughs> and uh, I ended up uh, having a very good instructor with the Vancouver Film School. And uh, I spent a year and a half taking all these acting classes and workshops and everything like that. And then uh, the way I became an armorer is uh, I was casted. Uh, I got a role on an old TV show called The Commish with Michael Chiklis. Yes. And I was a SWAT team commander. And uh, there was a table full of firearms. And I didn't even know it was an actual trade in the film industry uh, handling firearms. And at the time, it was my boss. He was training his girlfriend at the time, which is now his wife. And... Uh, he took me under his wing. I showed a great interest in it. And he says, well, if you want to do this, it's going to take a year apprenticeship. You got to do 25 hours a week minimum. And I'm, it's not going to cost you anything, but you got to put these hours in. And uh, I'm not paying you or anything like that. And you also have to take certain courses because I had to get my provincial license, then federal, and then eventually my international license. So it, it was quite a long path. I ended up doing 30 to 35 hours a week. And uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. And mm. fast forward three decades, and I'm still here. Wow. Uh, and just, uh, folks, take a look at, at this guy's IMDb. It is nuts. The talent <laughs> that you have had a chance to to work with. I mean, it's I, I every time I've been clicking on it, it's like, you know, I'd love to talk about this. Oh, I'd love to also talk about that. You know, I, I got <laughs> I got to focus mainly on Stargate and let the we'll let the fans pick some uh, some others if they want. Uh, but what kind? I mean, I can't imagine the ride that you have been on getting to uh, explore this facet of the industry with with all these talented people. Um, what uh, I want to get to safety. Uh, one of the first and foremost things I want to talk about. How. Uh, especially with Stargate, uh, how, how do I want to phrase this? Um, because it's, so, it's such a delicate thing these days, especially with everything, you know, that, that, that happened recently in, in the industry. Um, has everyone been on set always been cooperative in terms of the safety side of things? Have you ever had a situation where it was like, okay, you're a little too gung ho in this thing, not respecting the devices. We have to, the weapons we have to, no, we're not. We're not letting you mess with it. What's your experience been like over these decades? Well, as we know, in Hollywood and around the world, you have to deal with different characters, different egos, mm -hmm. different types of people. Right. And I would say 80 percent of the entire system is all about people skills. If you don't you can know everything in the world about firearms and how they're applied in film and be great on that. But if you do not have the people skills, you will not survive. It's not a, it's not for thin skinned people. That's right. for sure. You have to have tough skin. Um, I've, I've had some uh, situations, not so much on Stargate, but on other productions, but where uh, some people were um, questionable in their mental state. Mm -hmm. And then you have to make a decision and the decision you know, it can escalate very quickly in the wrong direction. So a lot of times uh, with the introduction of visual effects and blue screen and green screen and all that, I would just say, okay, well, I don't feel comfortable with this. We're going to CGI. It. And, I'd and say, you have the it, authority to, to make that. Claim. I have the final say when it comes to safety, uh, regardless of what the director or line producer, or anybody says, or even the cast uh, you know, you have to stand your ground because you're responsible for the safety of the cast and crew cut and dry. There's no way around it. 
I loved working on SG1 because I got to work with all four cast in the training. Uh, Richard Dean Anderson already had some skills with it because of MacGyver and other productions he's worked on. Amanda Tapping had no training. Neither did Chris Judge. And Michael Shanks was very new to it. And sometimes that's better than people that have been trained or trained the wrong way and they have these bad habits. It's better to start from scratch. And I did. I started from scratch. I treated them all equally the same, regardless of their skill level. And we went through steps. We went through steps with their sidearms, with their submachine guns, and eventually the P90, which was introduced in, I think, start of season three. That's a whole nother story itself, or season four. And um, I, I really enjoyed it because I became, I gained the trust of the cast. And then I also started to trust them. So we were all in the same mindset, especially dealing with cameras and positions of people and brass ejecting and muzzle flash and the dangers involved with using blanks, regardless if it's a quarter load or a full load, you had to have a very concrete choice. The minute you started to waffle on set or, well, you know, maybe they see right through you. You've already, you're incomplete at that point and, um, it's a very thankless industry sometimes, but the pros definitely outdo the cons, right? And um, I gained all this knowledge through the years because I knew a lot about firearms when I left the military, but I didn't know about film and how to apply it in film. And that's where my uh, my boss, Tom Falcon, he's the one that trained me right from the ground up and he would slowly introduce me into the industry. And then Stargate was my really big first episodic series that had incredible amount of firepower we would go through 80 to 100 thousand rounds per season sometimes even more and it was uh you know a lot of times i'd have to bring in help because you need more eyes on set more safety right but there uh and i was fortunate enough to play different roles in it and these roles were more or less given to me. Uh, I did audition for a few of them, but some of them were uh, for stunt work. And Dan Shea is a very good friend of mine. We played hockey together for many, many years. And he still gives me stunt work through the years. And um, I, I had to make sure that a lot of times my face was hidden because all of a sudden people would start to say, hey, wasn't he killed in this episode? And now he's playing this character. So continuity was very important back then and it still is today uh so sometimes they would put a scar on me or they would you know put a a mustache or something like that and then i'd get a speaking role uh morton wood who's was one of the directors and producers on it is a very good friend of mine he lives here in vancouver also and uh a lot of times he would just show up and say, Hey, Rob, I got a role and it's your, uh, you want to be a SWAT team commander and we'll give you three or four lines with the cast. It's a night shoot. And I'm like, I'm in. And I was there as the armor. And so I didn't want the two to overlap. So I'd end up just bringing an armor, one of my coworkers to take my place as I was casted in a part. And then when I was finished that I would take over. Yeah, but you have a clear that, line in the sand, you know, so everyone knows who's responsible for what. Absolutely. Yeah, you didn't want to have too many things going on because my job as an armor is I focus on the firearms only. That's all I do. I'm not looking at the props. I'm not looking at set deck or camera or grips or electrics. I'm focused on the firearms with the cast. I never leave set. If there's a firearm on set, I don't go to craft service. I don't go to the washroom. My attention is 100% on set. Mm-hmm. And uh, right from the start, right to the finish of the day. And uh, then there's always questions from cast or producers. And uh, there's been times where I was wrapped. And then all of a sudden, uh, Rob Cooper would say, hey, you know what? I got an issue with this next script. Can you give me a hand? And you would think it'd be a 20 minute thing. And then I'm there for another three hours. <laughs> so I enjoyed that because uh, it really uh, proved the worth of my qualifications on set so i i really got into it and i became part of that stargate family which i still have fond very fond memories of who took to the the weapons like a duck to water the most is there anyone in particular you know through the productions through any of them um, that you were like man they 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 have gotten it they got into they've gotten into it and 
they look they look so believable in it or they it's a second it's second nature to them well it was i think rda had probably the most experience so he picked it up quite quickly uh there was some tweaks that i had to do with all the cast because they all played four different characters you know you had one who was an alien one was a doctor and then you had rick and then amanda too who was also a doctor right so you had to they had to have a certain amount of weapons training but not too good because that wasn't their job they weren't frontline infantry until the stargate teams came to be and then they got in contact with the jaffa and other enemy and stuff like that but i think uh the the most firepower came if you're gonna say the forecast uh, was usually rick and amanda did the most firing mm -hmm. uh michael shanks was always trying to deal find ways of getting out of these bad environments and then dial. Had, <laughs> yeah and then you always had chris judge who uh, his character was always trying to just take the most direct route and the most physical route and stuff like that and he had to have firearms training too but you got to remember he was from another planet so he can't look like he's a navy seal so you had to work at certain levels the safety was always the same whether it was a co-star the cast or a, a person that came in for a day call mm -hmm. role it all had to be the same okay. there was no cut in the safety whatsoever and uh, we've done some incredible um, action scenes throughout that. Uh, you know, I I probably remember them back and forth. Sometimes I'll be in the shower and I'm like, oh, I remember that day. And it was great. And there was fantastic. We fired 30,000 rounds that day and it was massive explosions and, and, and gunfire and stuff like that. And then I get involved with the dialogue and then I would change certain things. Um, so it was it was a, a great ride. I would do it all over again if I could. I worked with uh, Christopher Judge on a on a project that predates this one called Dialing Home, and he said, "With Chris, you always got to be careful because sometimes he may stretch things a little bit." But yeah. he he had indicated, and I've been curious to ask you this. There was an episode where Chris says that Rick blew through the entire season budget of, of weaponry in one episode. And if it's true, it would have, I'm pretty sure it's, it's allegiance in season six when he does that 360 degree yes. shot with the Ashrak, the Ashrak's invisible. He says, everybody down, pop, 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 a lot of times they would budget episodically, but then they would, ammunition was different. They wanted to just order it all in one shot. And back then they didn't know where the scripts were going at that point. They would just say, okay, well, next episode is going to be more of a, we call a bottle episode. So it's not as action orientated. Yeah. It's more drama orientated and everything. But yeah, I do remember that episode because Rick was firing... I think he had the M60 or the M249, the the saw, and it was the saw because of a 200 round belt. And we just kept doing take after take after take because we had to alter the Steadicam operator with a gunfire, sometimes going opposite of his turn. And then we had to protect the camera, of course. So we had Lexan and stuff like that. And then I had to make sure the crew was safe because now we're firing 360 degrees. So basically I had the entire crew and we're filming up in the uh, in a forested area in North Vancouver, and I had the entire crew cramped in this one little section that had this little knoll that would cover them in case, for some reason, something came out of the barrel, whether it was a piece of brass or something like that, that everybody was safe. And it was quite the setup, and we were just doing take after take after take, and then I'm like... I'm out of ammo. I, I need to get more ammo almost. So I sent one of my armors down. Luckily, we're based in North Vancouver. I said, bring me another 5,000 rounds. And he brought me 10. And we went through eight. So we did eat up a lot of ammunition. Um, and it was, I, I'm not sure who was directing that episode, if you remember whatsoever. I, thought... I don't think it was Martin. I think it was Makita. Uh, Oh, Andy Makita, yeah. Double check. Probably Andy Makita. And he loved to do, you know, it was always the That no, was wide. Peter. I apologize. It was Peter Deloise. Oh, Peter Deloise, yes. Yeah. Peter. And if you did a great job, 
he would give you a loony. <laughs> a piece. Now, if you did a really good job, he would pull you aside and you always thought, what am, what do I do now? Am I in trouble? What's going on here? And he says, Rob, he says, that brought a tear to my eye. That was beautiful. And he gave me a toonie. So he gave me a $2 piece, $2 Canadian piece. <laughs> but it, it was kind of his sort of system that he used. And uh, he was funny, just a funny guy and great. And I still see him every now and then and we'll talk to each other. And I said, do you remember that episode? And I'm like, oh my God, that was crazy what we were doing and stuff like that. Not crazy as in safety, but just the amount of action orientated and coming all together in one. And it wasn't just one area. There was like, you know, catapults of different action scenes going on all around us. And, and, you know, the combat scenes with the Jaffa and the other enemy. And it was, uh, it was quite a ride. And I had to be on my A game every single day and I enjoyed it. I loved the challenge. And as the episodes went by and the years went by, there was a lot of trust there, not only with the cast, with the higher ups, with the whole production department, with the MGM and all that. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun. And I still speak with all four casts today, which is fantastic. Which um, it, Stargate has never had live rounds on set, right? It's always blanks. negative. No, there's no live rounds are never allowed on set ever. I've been doing this almost 30 years. I've never used live ammunition. If you if you're going to use live ammunition, you go to a gun range, not on a film set. How do you, but that obviously that doesn't completely eliminate the danger because the shells, well, they can still hurt. And I, I speak from experience. They burn when they hit you. Uh, I'm always curious. Let, let's, let's stick with allegiance for that example, because he's something is damaging all of these buildings. How is that achieved on the other side? I'm curious. As in what? As in the the, shell the impact, pieces? the impacts to the to the targets that are being shot. The buildings are getting you know are getting holes put in them, and you've got you've got sparks going off. Oh On yeah. the so other the, side the of that, squibs. how is that pulled off? The, can you tell me a little about about the squibs? Uh, yeah. With uh, I was very close with the effects department. I was hired by the props department, and we had several prop masters through the seasons, right? But I had to work in conjunction with effects all the time because what I dealt with is a form of special effects. But it's a very, very specialized trade that uh, that I work in. And uh, they're all friends of mine back then. I became very close with the effects. And I would say, OK, this is the rate of fire on the P90. Let me see what you have in the box for the squib hits. And because we want to time it so when he pulls a trigger, it begins. When he stops, it ends sort of thing. And they they were probably one of the best effects teams that i worked with for timing it was just incredible they'd have certain guys on the button and uh they would say well how big would the hole be rob i said well okay well a p90 is 5.7 millimeter or an mp5 is nine millimeter so you had to judge the size of the hole and then what hollywood likes to do is over accentuate and make the massive holes i'm like okay it's not a 50 cal round coming from an aircraft it's it's a, it's coming from a rifle or submachine gun, so the holes wouldn't be that big. And sometimes you had to compromise because the hole would be so small that camera couldn't pick it up back then, you know. And back then we we're still using film, right? Before we did the transition to the Reds and HD and all that. So, uh, you know, I would compromise a bit. I said, okay, you can go a little bit bigger, but don't go too big. But remember, if you're going to have an entry exit you have to have an exit wound too. Right. And because uh, a lot of times the, the squibs are blowing outwards and stuff, I'm like, well, the bullet didn't go around him and come out the other side. And I try to bring that realism. Sometimes they didn't have time to do exit wounds and stuff like that. So, you know, you don't, you can only suggest certain things as because I was also the technical advisor on the show. I, I basically had both jobs combined uh, in one person. And, uh, it was it was a it was a ton of fun because when the explosions kicked in, I said, "Look, it's a hand grenade. It's not a thousand pound bomb coming from an F eighteen. It's a hand grenade, so the explosion wouldn't be that massive, right? And the massive fireball and stuff. I says it's very contained, uh, whether it's blown up inside or outside. So 
a lot of times I would have meetings with the effects department. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we have a meeting with the director and I'd say, well, okay, I suggest this and this. You can only suggest, I'm not the director. I can give them options, which they love. But if you paint them in a corner, they don't like that. But you have to give them options. And by doing so, um, you allowed that sort of freedom for, you know, camera, the type of lens to use, how close you could get, how far away you had to be, whether you had to protect the camera or if it was unmanned or if it was on a crane or what have you. There was infinite, infinite types of uh, situations you could be put in. And I loved it because I could judge something within seconds. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is I could see it in the blocking what I have to do before we even rehearse. So then the minute we were done blocking, the cast would go back with uh, to hair, makeup, costumes, what have you. I would talk with the first AD, who were all, all friends of mine, seasons in and stuff like that. I said, okay, this is what we have to do. Let's protect A and B cameras. C is fine up on that ridge. They're well away. They're not being pointed at. And I says, um, let's move this uh, video village always likes to be very close as we know in film right they always want to be right up close so then i'd say can i would tell the camera trainees or the uh, or the uh, tads or the third ad i said look we just need to move video village back another 20 feet and they say okay rob no problem but you you have to let them know that ahead of time not on the day and that's why i was involved right right from the start the minute i picked up the firearms at our shop to the time that I brought him back to the shop there was no lag in between I was constantly involved that's why they paid me as a professional and uh my idea of a perfect day is everybody goes home safe wow. and that's it did you ever have a scare on on Stargate in those 17 seasons uh not on Stargate on other productions I've had a couple where I've had to yell cut okay and then when you yell cut in a big action scene you better have the right answer. You better have a reason why you're doing that because as we know, film is expensive and time is expensive. And there were certain, uh, it was a certain feature that I worked on and we rehearsed it, rehearsed it, rehearsed it. And it dealt with two A-list actors. And I won't say what production it was, but um, one of the actors missed his mark by about three or four feet. And it would have been, there would have been a tragedy because the other person would have walked right into his two two foot muzzle flash right and without the other actor seeing it and i saw what was happening ahead of time i put my hand in front of the lens and i yelled cut and i stopped everything director wasn't uh very pleased with that and like what the hell's going on and blah 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 so then i explained it and then the actor said thanks rob holy smokes you know like that's why you're here i says absolutely I says, nobody else could see it, but I could see it happening because I've done it many, many, I've done it thousands of times. So uh, safety is always number one on set, 100%. How do you pull off, uh, you talk about squibs. Uh, there is, one of my favorite moments uh, f from, a, from a weapon standpoint, it's, it's many among the, the fan community will agree with me on this one. There is there is a badass Carter moment in a season five episode called The Warrior, where she shreds a a tree trunk uh, with a P ninety, and mm. I always wonder how you guys pulled that off without actually shooting that tree trunk to bits. You'd have to shoot it with something. She's explaining. She and Jack are explaining to this uh, this Jaffa uh, 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 dissident group. Um, how you know handy our weapons will come in when you're not shooting just plasma bolts at at an object that will just scar the surface of it, and she sh she cuts this this tree trunk in half that's suspended on a on a on a wire, and then she switches on the P90 to single shot and she takes the wire out <laughs> and knocks the thing. How did you guys pull that off? Well, that was I, I remember that day because. Uh... Amanda wanted some uh, refresher training. She hadn't fired the P90 in a while. The beautiful thing about the P90 is it's bottom ejection. So you could have actors side by side. Nobody's going to eat each other's empty casings that are ejecting out of the firearm. They go straight down. And um, 
the caliber of the p90 is a very it's like a little dart it's called it's 5.7 by 28 millimeter and it's like a hyper round it's uh like a hyper kinetic round so what it does is it travels so fast that it'll penetrate body armor like even level five body armor level 4a it'll go right through it so it has a high penetration rate for such a small round uh it was designed in belgium by the Fabrique Nationale. And uh, there's a story behind that also, how we got the P90s. But um, yeah, I, I said, Amanda, I says, the beauty about the P90 is the magazine sits right on top. And you can see how many rounds you have left because it starts to the front and it works its way back. So the actual round is canters basically 90 degrees and as it rotates, it's floating in the air when it's chambered and fired. And then it's extracted and ejected right straight below that position. So I said, when you fire the P90, don't be shy to blaze, blaze, blaze with it. You know how long it takes to burn off 50 rounds. They've done it a million times. But I said, don't be shy to look down to see how many rounds you have left. Because you don't want to run out. You want to be able to fire, fire, fire. And the, uh, the, the selector switch is right below the trigger. And I said, just click it to R, repetition, and then just do your single shot on that. And she did it perfect every time. Amanda was uh, a treat to work with because um, she had no firearms experience. So like I said, that sometimes that's the best way to learn is right from the ground up. And she did her share of firepower on that show mm -hmm. also and stuff like that. Uh, there are times... Uh, I would constantly ask them, I said, do you have your earplugs in? Do you have your earplugs in? And uh, there was a time, this is not on SG-1, this was on Atlantis with uh, Jason Momoa. He was firing a G36K, which is a, a German-made assault rifle. Um, and the first take went great. The second take, I think it was Mark, uh, Andy Makita was directing, I think, that episode. It was inside the ship. And he forgot his earplugs. I didn't ask. Him. And as he comes around the corner, uh, his co-star unloads. And he just drops the G36. And his hands go right here. I'm like, I thought, did he get hit by a casing or something like that? I says, that's weird because it's a P90. It ejects down from his co-star. And he says, and he whispers in my ear. He goes, my ears are ringing, Rob. I forgot to put my earplugs in. I'm like, oh. So, it hurts. Says, but he goes, don't, don't tell anyone. I said, uh, okay. I, I just said, uh, yeah, I'm going to change this uh, G36. I said, there's a problem with the selector on it. I, I don't feel comfortable with this. So I basically <laughs> covered Jason's butt, which is great because we became very good friends too. And uh, I'll tell you the introduction of the, of the P90. Yeah, Jeremy it, Heiner uh, wanted to know what led to the switch uh, around season four of SG-1 and later well, Atlantis. He's got a PS9 in. He loves it. Oh, he does. Okay. Well, the when when we did the first episodes, they wanted the same firearms that they used in the Stargate movie, which was the MP5. And back then it was the Alpha 2 model, the A2 model. And we used everything from the A2 to the A5s. And it all has to do with the select lever, the type of look it has and stuff like that. All made by the same company. And I'm like, you know, they're traveling to all these different planets. It's a submachine gun round. It doesn't have a lot of range. And it's not really meant for fighting in like in the in a, a built up area of trees and stuff like that in big open fields. It's a close quarter battle weapon. It's made for SWAT teams or SEAL teams that are very close quarter. It's a it, it has a great stopping power and all that. But I'm like, it's the wrong weapon for this team. And I, I tried to push it in back in season two and season three. They're like, we're already invested. We have all these rubbers and replicas made for all these SG teams. And I said, OK, so start of season four, we had a big production meeting. I think we were two weeks out from doing the first episode and we had the P90s and we ordered, I think we purchased 10 of them. It was extremely hard to get because being French, I had to speak French to Belgium back and forth with the company 
And lucky because of that, we they said, look, we'll give you the wet firearms, but they can't be used in bad taste. They have to be a positive effect. Very, I call it the top gun theory, right? And um, I said, finally, we got the firearms. And I think we got them about a month before we went to that meeting. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to bring this firearm, obviously clear and safe, to the production meeting. And I had the case with me and we're going through the script and this and that. And then they mentioned, oh, and, you know, Carter and O'Neill both have their MP5s and Michael Shanks just has a sidearm and he's always carrying a, a Pelican case of some sort, right? He always had some type of scientific equipment and stuff like that. And a lot of times Teal'c would carry his staff, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the one of the producers, and I think it was Brad Wright, goes rob just a question what's in the case behind you i'm like uh -huh. so i said look i says i have a firearm here and um i think it's going to be perfect for our team and i basically pulled out the p90 andy makita was sitting there martin wood was there and um alex pappas who's a very good friend of mine who's retired he was also there all the ad's were there i, I just showed them look guys it's clear and safe and they're like Oh, that's incredible. Well, wow. and so I explained to them the basically the the everything about the P90. It's stopping power, it's range, it's mobility, it's compactness, and it's user friendly. And they're like, uh, I can't remember which producer it was, maybe it was Robert Cooper. He says, That's great. He says, uh, uh, do they have real ones out there we could use? He thought we fabricated that out of nothing. I said, No, this is a real firearm. I said, we have 10 of them ready to go. And they're like, really? I says, well, yeah, uh, it's it's ready for the show. We can do a transition where they get the P90s introduced in season four. And they loved it. And from then on, it stuck. You know, we still use different firearms. We had MP5s. We had the SAW, the M60. We had numerous types of firearms. But the SG-1 team, that was their benchmark. And they loved it because... I uh, I helped introduce a certain type of holster, not a holster, a sling. So they can do this. They can do this. And Rick was always doing this, right? He would just sit there and listen. But they loved it because it was always in front of them. It wasn't long. It didn't have sharp edges. They fell in love with it right from day one. But before we even got to that, I had to train the cast again because now there's a new weapon system. So then I think it was two or three days before all the cast were in town. I said, look, I just need, give me two hours with the cast. Give me the gate room. I'll do it in the gate room. Give me some production assistance to lock the doors. I want full lockdown. Just me and the cast, no one else. I'm going to run them through the dry training, and then we're going to test fire because we did a lot of firing in that gate room, as you know. And um, I I had the forecast. I said, okay, we're going to fire some firearms here. All P90s, you're going to load on your own. You know how to do it. I've just showed you for the last few hours. And they all loaded it, they chambered the round, they put it on automatic, and they're like, well, what about the brass? I'm like, don't worry about the brass. I said, just don't wear sandals or flip-flops in here. That's all. <laughs> and uh, they loved it. They all unloaded their magazines, and they pulled the magazines out, because I had, I trained the actors on everything, how to clear misfires and jams, how to change mags. They were self-sufficient. And it got, as they fired the weapon more and more and more, they got more comfortable with it and they knew the effects because we used everything from full loads, which is a huge muzzle flash. You're looking at two feet out of the P90 to a quarter load, which was about six inches, right? And sometimes we, we had some very um, noise uh, environments that uh, th there was bylaws where they, they couldn't achieve over a certain decibel rating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but... Anytime we're in the stage, people love the full loads. They're more reliable. They're cleaner burning. They look great on camera. And the muzzle flash is so big that a lot of times the film would cover multiple flashes compared to HD today, which pretty much captures all of it. Mm. And a lot of times the quarter loads were, were so minute, they don't have to enhance it by CGI. But they had something at least. I had options for them. Um, and then we had these high-end rubbers that were made for the actors when they weren't firing. And then we had really good replicas. So I actually had three of everything, three replicas 
for each actor, three rubber guns for each actor, because sometimes there was a stunt double or there was a second unit filming that day and I had to match them one to one. There couldn't be anything different. Um, uh, like Amanda liked to, uh, she liked to have her weapon a little bit higher so she could flip it into her shoulder. Where Rick liked his a little lower, Chris didn't care. He was like, okay, whatever, it fits, it's great and all that. And Michael Shanks would be like, yeah, okay, Rob, I want it just off-centered a bit. I'm like, no problem. So I modified a lot of their uh, slings and everything was great and stuff like that. And then it was as simple as, okay, we're doing a stunt here and I would unhook the real P90 and put on a rubber one, boom. And then they'd go to do the stunt. It was a nice, we had foam rubbers, we had hard rubbers, you had all different types. We had a whole team of uh, prop molders that were making everything and they did such a great job. I know that a lot of those rubber firearms uh, are in various producers' offices or, you know, down in Hollywood or <laughs> with the cast. Because when we did finish the show, they they obviously wanted a lot of it for memorabilia, right? Absolutely. It's it's non-functional. So. <laughs> it's non-functional. It's just a piece of rubber. And yeah. you, you watch these shows, everything, Westworld. I mean, the the P90, you, you can see it everywhere now like it really caught on fire with the uh, the the uh, everyone's recognizing the utility of, of that piece they're easy to handle you know i've held one myself they're um they're they're just right for the show but as we went into universe you started expanding back out into some other pieces i i don't i'm trying to recall if universe even had p90s was there a reason for that I think uh, a lot had to do with the production. Okay. Uh, with the with the producers, I said, "Look, we want to go a little bit different from mm -hmm. S one because they were implanted. They already had, I think, six or seven seasons in already. Uh, at that point. Universe uh, Universe came when SG one and Atlantis were done. Yeah. Uh, when did Atlantis kick in? Uh, when it season was... eight of SG one. Season eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think they. So when we had meetings with that, they said, do you have anything else that's not a P90 because it's a benchmark for SG-1? I said, yeah, actually we do. So I said, we have thousands of firearms at our shop. Why don't you just come to us? And so I, I set up a meeting with all the higher ups and the directors for the first three episodes. I said, and I, I made a really nice display. I said, look, these are the weapons that I think we should use. We, we have very good rubber versions of they're the latest and greatest. They always wanted the high tech stuff. They didn't want anything older, a period piece weapon. The MP5, it came out in the 1960s. It was called Project 63. So it's been around a long time. And because they had so many replicas and rubbers that the, they, the production already purchased, they didn't want to stray away from that. But for their lead actors, they said, okay, we want to an M4 with a grenade launcher on it. And then we want this and we would like this. We'd like the muzzle flash out of this, but you're going to have to train the cast. This is no problem. I said, that's why I'm here. I love training the cast because it's when you don't have any time with them and they say, okay, he's a Navy SEAL, but you got 10 minutes. And I'm like, well, that's a two hour, two day, two year program. Right. And you want me to train him as a Navy SEAL in 10 minutes, you're going to get 10 minutes worth. Yeah. So a lot of times they, they'll they push aside uh, a certain training day. Uh, sometimes we'd go to a, a, an actual gun range, but there was really no need for it. I said, look, I just need one of the studio spaces. Or I would take them out of town into a certain area that was private property and we'd fire blanks all day. There was really no need to fire live. Um, and it the people that uh, don't understand is blanks have virtually no recoil. It's about one fifth of what an actual bullet does. Wow. So there's very little recoil. Now, if you try to imitate that recoil on an automatic weapon, you actually can jam the gun because the guns are fine tuned with the gases involved, with the, the powder expanding and stuff like that, that if you try to imitate the recoil, you'll actually absorb the recoil and you'll jam the gun. So I had to try and explain that to the cast and they kind of look at you and they're like, what? I don't get it. I said, and some of them would try and imitate the recoil too much and they would definitely jam the gun. And I said, there's a small extent you can do. And with the P90, it was such a powerful little firearm that it actually gave recoil, even with the blanks. So you didn't have to do anything. You just had to point and shoot, obviously point in a safe direction and fire. 
but uh, the actors didn't have to imitate anything. It actually, uh, our, all of our blanks are made down in Arizona and they're custom made in a very controlled environment. And we've been dealing with the same, uh, uh, the same blank manufacturer since 1994, I think 94, 95. And we've been dealing with him and now we're the distributor for his blanks up here in Canada. So it's a, uh, it's a fantastic company. And, um, I learned a lot on SG1 in all the aspects of how many different, sometimes the single gunshot could be the most dangerous also mm -hmm. compared to firing thousands of rounds in a take. So you have to be aware at all times of what's going on. Uh, if I didn't feel comfortable with something and I would say, I wouldn't be rude or anything about it. I said, look, I would feel more comfortable if this actor was two feet this way and we can push this actor up so he's not going to eat his empty casings and no one's going to get hit in the face or stuff like that. Because when an empty casing comes out, there's obviously no bullet, but it has it's a casing with a primer and it has the propellant inside the powder. It gets hot. And when it opens up the crimp, it can be sharp too. Yeah. So if you get nicked by it, it can cut you and stuff like that. So there were times where I'm like, nope, this doesn't work and stuff like that. I says, I have to readjust. Give me five minutes. And they're like, okay, Rob, you got five minutes. And then I would readjust it. And I've done entire, you know, sometimes we'd have 50, 60 firearms shooting in one sequence. Uh, my focus obviously was always the cast, right? And then I'd have other armors handling the stunt performers or the background performers or the co-stars and stuff like that. So I said, and until I was satisfied, everything was hundred percent. We didn't shoot, we didn't fire any weapons and stuff like that. I said, look, you want this done right. And you want to get it in one take, maybe two, but the resets were quite long, especially with the squibs and reloading of ammunition and magazines. So I said, just give me that five minutes. Trust me, it'll work out great. And you know, hundred percent of the time it was, uh, it worked out being great. And sometimes they'd want to change the camera angle and said, we're getting, we're going to do it again. And there's another hour and a half reset of effects is hard at it. And they're picking up all the brass and because now it's a fresh sequence again, and I'm there reloading magazines or I have preloaded mags or we're running bore brushes through the farms. Cause one thing that people don't know is with blanks, they are extremely dirty compared to a live round when you fire a live round out of a weapon that's not modified to fire blanks 95 percent of the powder and everything goes out the barrel well with the blank a lot of it's captured inside a lot of the mm. powder the the burnt powder and you know the cordite smell that they have is contained in the firearm especially in the chamber area where all the action is happening so people are like oh it's great yeah though i could do your job i'm like well let's take that weapon apart and if you can take it apart and clean it and name all the parts in it <laughs> right down to the spring on the bolt and then put it together and do a function test, then I might have you help me load mags one day. So I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg right here. There's so much more to it than just loading a firearm and having it go bang on a film set. What would you do with all the brass? Would it get recycled? Yes. Yes. Uh, we recycled it. Uh, it has to be cleaned because they won't take dirty brass. And as we know, there's black powder all over it and uh, uh, gunpowder. So we'd have to clean it all. And there would be days on Stargate where I would fill a garbage can, like a Rubbermaid garbage can, to the top before lunchtime. And you're like, my boss loved it. He's like, well, that's that's a good chunk of money right there, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, you had to read the scene. And that's where a, a good armor would say, okay, well, this is a big action scene. You have all these stunt players. You have all these cast. I I would judge, you know, and I'm very good at judging at, uh, you know, obviously budgeting ammunition. It's always a money thing in today's world and even back then, but more so now. I would say, you know what, this whole sequence, I need 20,000 rounds. And they're like, oh my God, 20,000 rounds. And I'm like, I said, yeah, it's in that garbage can filled to the rim right now. And luckily I brought another 10 just in case as a backup and chances are you're going to use that 10 and sure enough, they're like, Oh, we have 10. Well, you got to go through the chain of command with the production manager, get the approval. Said, look, we want to use some more ammunition. These sequences are going well. And the directors modified something or like that. 
but you, you, you never want to run. I've only run out of ammo once and I had to send somebody down and it was on Atlantis. I'm like, Oh, there won't be much fire in this. And then we had, I think it was Mario as a party. Okay. Season, yeah. season one, season one, that was and... childhood's end. I think he did. And he no, came with a heavy Italian. Well, he came with a heavy Italian accent. Oh, goes, yes. By lunchtime, I was out of ammo and I sent for more. And he goes, Rob, after lunch, 10 times more than this. It will be much more firepower. Okay. And I went, No problem, Mario. Coming in. I brought in two more armors. I brought in another 15,000 rounds. I got the approval with production. I said, Look, Mario wants this. And we are humming. I says, I didn't, I misjudged this day for blank ammunition. I thought we were going to do maybe two or three takes. And here we are in take seven. And we're still doing where they were shooting at the uh, air, uh, the Jaffa uh, aircraft. And I'm like, I, I need a lot more ammo and stuff like that. So, and he was, I would never know with his facial expressions with Mario, whether he was upset or happy or he kind of had one facial expression. <laughs> but at the end of the day, everything was safe. I think we did. A, it was like a eighteen thousand round day, strictly P ninety, very expensive ammunition, very different caliber. He comes up. He goes, "Rob, come here," and I go to his. Uh, you know, everybody's packing up and stuff like that. We're wrapped, and I go by the uh, video village, and he goes, "You are a wonderful man," and he gives me a big hug and a big Italian kiss on the forehead. <laughs> And he goes, that was a fantastic day. And I'm like, I I guess I did good. I guess he likes me. Yeah. So uh it was it was tons of fun, right? So you had to, you know, you had to try and please people. Yeah. But at the same time, you had to be safety, right? I wasn't there to be friends with every single person. I was there to do a job. And yeah. to this day, that's still how I do it. Job first, safety first, friends come second, third, fourth, whatever, right? Wow. Thank you so much for for sharing these stories. It's it's uh, it's wild to hear how much is involved with it because it's not it's just not pointing and shooting a weapon. You know, there's all kinds of layers that have to be involved, and I, I really appreciate you coming on to sharing those to share uh, those stories. So, oh, it's my pleasure. I enjoy every minute of it. Thank you, sir. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, wrap up the show on this end, and I'll I'll be in touch. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, David, and have yourself a great day. Thank you. And remember, Rob. Jaffa Cree. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Jeez. Be well. Take care. Rob Fournier, everyone, armorer on Stargate SG-1, Atlantis, and Universe. Really uh, appreciate you tuning in. Hope you're enjoying the show. Uh, we have coming up, uh, let me see here. Let's see ya. Uh, I appreciate everyone who uh, who submitted questions. Uh, Rick Donner, Dan Ben, Chirp ninety, um, we we got to, to most of those. We have in the next couple of minutes here. We're getting ready for uh, Gary Jones. He's going to host episode one ninety nine with the entire Dial the Gate uh, team. So we're going to uh, uh, gear up for that. I appreciate you tuning in. Hope you're going to stick around for that. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate, and we will see you on the other side.